Hey, this is Ken Chen, and welcome to another episode of God Encounters. I'm so excited today. We have a special guest with us, professor at East Texas Baptist University, a biblical scholar, a man who has spent most of his life studying the scriptures, and not only studying the scriptures, but teaching the scriptures to young men uh, coming up who feel called of God into the ministry, uh, Dr. Jeff Holloway. Jeff's also written a book. We'll put this in the description box at the end. Uh, the Poetics of Grace. This is a great read. I'm, I don't know, maybe a, a, a third of the way through it, working my way through this, but a great book. Uh, we'll also do this. Uh, the first person that makes a comment in the thread, uh, I will personally send you a free copy of uh, Dr. Holloway's book. So I'm sure you want to get this where you can dig deeper into the scriptures. And uh, it's certainly the meat. It's not the, the milk of the word. But today we're going to be discussing um, a topic that it's just there's a lot of wide ranging uh, views on this. Um, and we're going to let Dr. Holloway guide us scripturally through this and historically some of the, uh, the different councils possibly that have come up to the the faith that we proclaim is uh, what we would commonly, I guess, call the virgin birth. So with that, I'm going to welcome Dr. Holloway to our program, and I appreciate, really appreciate you taking your time out and uh, sharing with us and with our audience about why we believe what we believe. You know, we believe what? Why do we believe it? Yeah, why do we believe, uh, like, what we speak of as the virgin birth? Well, uh, that kind of goes way, way back, and I think yes. we've got two really important passages in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 and then Luke chapter 1, where both accounts in different ways and different emphases want to highlight this. Yes. Uh, you know, why we believe, what we believe, um, it is the case that uh, this is a, a doctrine that has been maybe for the last couple of hundred years more and more contested in many yes. circles, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which kind of surprises me, or, or at least in this respect, you know, there will be those who would say, "Well, I, yes, I believe that Jesus died on the cross; he was raised from the dead." Maybe you know, mm -hmm. embrace many features of the Christian faith. I believe right. that God is the creator of all things and so yes. on. But then at this point, express a measure of hesitancy or even outright resistance. Right. And I, I kind of find that a little surprising um, in that, my goodness, if God can create a universe, yeah. uh, if God can raise the dead, mm -hmm. then why balk at... Uh, the virgin birth, um, or we might want to be more specific and we can okay. get into this, the virginal conception, virginal conception. of Christ. We'll, okay. We maybe won't want to come back to that. Uh, but it is, to me, it's pretty clear in both Matthew chapter 1 where an angel speaks to Joseph and when Joseph has discovered that Mary is with child and he knows he's not the father, huh. Uh, he's going to put her away yes. secretly and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but he is assured by an angel that, no, uh, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. Right. That which she bears has been conceived of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, it, it's Gabriel not speaking to Joseph, but to Mary herself when mm -hmm. he has told her that she will bear the Son of God um, how can this be? For I have not known a man. And mm -hmm. she clearly is underscoring that she's not had any sexual activity yes. uh, whatsoever. And then again, the assurance comes that this is going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it's there and <laughs> it's emphasized. Now what some would say is, well, we just have these two passages some people want to point elsewhere to other passages like Galatians 4, where right. Paul might say, you know, he does say, born of a woman. Born of a woman. Uh, is that an explicit reference to the virgin birth? Uh, that's debated. Some people want to 
downplay the significance of this because of its fairly scarce mention in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But I would think, I would yeah. say that that's a, a mistake, uh, that there's so much riding on this. There it that, is. That uh, to underscore the unique identity of Jesus, that is it ex itself uh, the, the focus of the virginal conception of Christ mm -hmm. uh, is essential for the gospel's message of salvation. Yes. And that's gonna be a major issue of discussion down the road. You mentioned those councils that would come up in mm -hmm. Nicaea or Chalcedon or Ephesus right. hundreds of years later. But there will be a major focus on if, if this is just one more Jewish person dying on a cross. Right. The Romans did that by the hundreds of thousands. Sure. So sure. what's the big deal there? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I kind of skirted around this matter of virgin birth versus virginal conception. We, mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Uh, the language of Scripture is the virgin shall conceive, and mm -hmm. that's kind of where I would want to highlight that. That would be really more in line with what the scripture teaches, yeah. virginal, virginal conception versus virginal birth. And, and there might be some important considerations that come in with that. Mm -hmm. um, down the road, uh, on into the, certainly into the fourth, third, fourth, and fifth centuries, the emphasis really does shift to uh, uh, more of a focus on Mary's role in all this, and clearly mm -hmm. she plays a pivotal role. Exactly. But to speak of the virgin birth kind of merges into the idea held, particularly among Roman Catholics, of the virginal, yes. of the perpetual virginity mm -hmm. of Mary. Right. And there are reasons why they wanted to highlight that. Nice. Uh, but um, well, from Scripture, we know that Jesus had. Four brothers, I forget his particular name, well, or, or half brothers. One or, is Jude, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm yes. persuaded. Yes. Uh, so, yes, uh, half brothers, um, sisters as well. So, uh, the, the question idea. becomes uh, you know, uh, why would they want to emphasize the perpetual virginity of Mary? Mm -hmm. And that has to do. I think, with this concern to highlight uh, one theory behind the virgin, virginal conception, and that is that such was necessary in order to safeguard the sinlessness of Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, nowhere in the New Testament is that specific correlation made. Right. It does Certainly, Hebrews is quite emphatic. He was tempted in all ways as we are yet without sin. Mm -hmm. Matthew and Luke are quite emphatic. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Mm -hmm. uh, are they brought together in that way? One reason why some people want to do that and then move on into the perpetual virginity of Mary and move back to the immaculate conception of Mary, that That's Mary right. herself did not bear the sin of Adam, mm -hmm. um, and she too was born of a virgin, right. um, is, is just a, a belief about the, the character of sin that developed down the road. Mm -hmm. And that is with Augustine, and that sin is transmitted from one generation to the next through the instrumentality yes. of, of intercourse. Right. That sin is, in effect, a sexually <clears throat> transmitted disease. <laughs> and um, there is some textual reliance. So there, you know, there are people who want to point to like Psalm 51, 51. Romans chapter five. Yes. Um, the language I'm persuaded is not that explicit mm -hmm. along those lines. The reality is that each and every one of us are born into a situation where we're in over our heads. Yes. That we are. We can uh, all agree on that. There, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes. What is the precise mechanism by which such is transmitted from one generation to the next? Augustine is the one who would identify uh, sexual transmission of mm -hmm. this problem. Okay. And 
And I think that that reflects more of Augustine's own personal background, his own struggles as a young man with his own inclinations. Uh, Augustine had quite a wild and crazy youth where he Mm -hmm. would uh, be the first to admit of his his problems. He once prayed, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, I I think Uh, that kind of informed some of his own uh, attitudes, and we've <laughs> got to recognize as well that Augustine clearly journeyed through um, a number of different philosophical schools yes. of thought mm-hmm. regarding the nature of evil before he comes to the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. And some of his background in his uh, engagement with what was called Neoplatonism, mm-hmm. that underscores just a, a real suspicion of the body. I think that has to do with some of Augustine's own outlook. But mm-hmm. be that as it may, of the, getting back to the virginal conception, that is, I think, the biblical emphasis. And it really wants to raise, ultimately, this question of, well, what is the nature of Jesus? Yes. Who is Jesus? How do we understand who he is? And that is crucial because we understand him to be the savior. And Mm -hmm. how is it that he is the savior? How is it that his death on the cross deals with the fundamental issues of our own um, desperate situation? Mm -hmm. And the virginal conception I believe is integral to. Why do you think that, uh, or what are some of your thoughts about why the church seems to just want to just skip over this and just really just dismiss it or kind of ignore it or put it out of their minds. That, but it's really one of the basic tenets of the faith. Well, I, I believe it is one of the basic tenets of the faith. And, you know, when you get to the development of Christian confession over the centuries, Yes. We, we look to the Apostles' Creed, or behind the Apostles' Creed, we have what was called the rule of faith, even in the second century. And mm-hmm. without fail, these writers of, uh, in, in positions of leadership in the early church, they would all affirm the virginal conception that Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, yes. who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. The Nicene Creed will expand on that. Pretty clear, cut and dry, yeah. black and white. Why? You know, here's, here's uh, th- that's a great question that could be raised about so many features okay. of the Christian faith these days. Well, I think when you take that... Right at the very beginning, though, when you start taking yeah. that out, I mean, we're we're in chapter one, Matthew one. Yeah, Luke, right. You know, when you start taking this out, it's like the dominoes start to fall on on the other. What I would consider, what I believe, basic tenets of the faith. If you, if you, you know, it, it, uh, one one writer, uh, uh, Thomas Oden, has a very fine three volume set on systematic theology, and he he makes the point that. Uh, this this stands at the very beginning, right. and it it really is the foundation for all else that unfolds in yes. the story of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, because what we're talking about again is the very nature of who is Jesus, Jesus. as mm-hmm. Messiah, and the language that would be developed is like out of the Nicene Creed, very God or truly God of God, truly man of man, Mm -hmm. fully God, fully human in one person. And then this insistence that it it is not up to us to pick apart who Jesus is and assign different aspects. Well, that's the human part of Jesus. That's the divine part of Jesus, as if Jesus were like a modular Right, yeah, you got component stereo yes. system of the 1970s. You yeah, know, exactly. got yeah. your eight track here. You got, mm-hmm. you know, you got your turntable over here and all. Mm-hmm. No, who in everything of who he is is fully divine, fully human, mm-hmm. and 
we might later on want to get into the specifics of what yeah. is the significance of the car in the incarnation. Yeah. What is the importance of that affirmation that, like we're seeing here at Christmas time, what's the wonderful uh, hymn? Uh, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Mm. Uh, hail the incarnate deity. Yes. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. Mm. What difference does that make? What difference does it make that, that the child that Mary holds is the creator of the universe. Mm. I mean, that's the emphasis yeah. of John chapter one. In the beginning was the word, the word was God. The yes. word's with God. Okay. Uh, the word was made flesh to mm. dwell in our midst. Yes. Uh, we're, we're talking about the unique center of what is at the core of the Christian faith. Now, we, we want to talk about the cross of Christ and the resurrection. But again, if Jesus is just a another human being and not a, a the good incarnate, teacher. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, right. Then uh, the Romans crucified just hundreds man. of thousands of people. Sure, his story is nothing unique. Precisely. Yeah. On the other hand, if he is not fully uh, human, human, and he is simply well, let, let me give a term here. Uh, the, uh, of a school of thought, a heresy that developed as time went by in the second century. It's mm -hmm. called docetism. Yes. Does that name ring a bell from your own uh, studies? Right. Yeah. Docetism. It comes from the Greek word docheo, which means to appear to be the case or to right. seem to be. And there were those uh, in the early church, second century and, and so on, that said, oh, Jesus just appeared to be human. Right. If he just appeared to be human, but not fully human, then what, is it, what does the cross have to do with us? Mm -hmm. Because we are we are human. We are all too human. We are. And if that is not one of us who mm -hmm. suffers on our behalf, then how does that relate to us? Yes. So the the central affirmation of fully God, fully man, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, mm -hmm. is that apart from that, the whole business of the cross becomes irrelevant. It does, it does. Or we, but you know, you are familiar with those who want to speak of Jesus as, um, a fine example, okay? Yeah. okay. Uh, somebody who was noble. Even the atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had a certain level of admiration for Jesus yeah. sure. because he did uh, uh, went against the prevailing trends mm -hmm. of society, and Nietzsche was all for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, is this just a noble effort? on the part of Jesus mm -hmm. when he is then uh, crucified as a martyr? Yeah. Or is there something of, of deeper, more profound significance where the full Humanity. brokenness of a, a corrupted creation is addressed on yeah. the cross? Well, we know like that from the scriptures, Jesus got hungry when he was yeah. tempted in the wilderness. He got tired. Thirsty. And uh, thirsty. He was, it says, it says in Hebrews, he was in all points tempted, just yeah. like we are. Yeah. So if he wasn't fully human, he didn't experience the way we would experience things. You know, it does take the equation out of the Savior. What type of a Savior would he be, if a Savior at all? Um, and then uh, John one fourteen talks about, you know, Christ being manifested in the flesh, the Word right. made flesh and dwelt yeah. among us. We beheld his glory. He, his the glory. glory now, that's such own. an important term in the Gospel yes. of John, his glory. <clears throat> that is the manifestation of God. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> the, the word was made flesh. We beheld his glory mm -hmm. right there. That Power. is you, the. You got a lot right in there. <laughs> exactly. 
Uh, and again, it, it is underscoring the uniqueness of, of Jesus. Yes. And, and you know, that, that might be something we need to uh, give some uh, attention to. And, and for this reason, whether we're talking about the Trinity or we're talking about the Incarnation or we often want to explain things in terms of analogies. Mm-hmm. And there have been people who, you yes. know, in biblical scholarship who've wanted to uh, see parallels between the uh, materials in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 1 and other stories of other quasi-divine beings in the right. ancient world like, you know, Hercules, the, the mm-hmm. son of... Uh, of Zeus and a human woman, uh, okay? Yeah. And uh, that's not a what we're of, talking about. A lot of those stories. Right, Pl- there are plenty of those. Mm-hmm. But there is, for one thing, the Greek gods are gonna come down from Olympus and they're gonna carry on and they're gonna trick women into having sex with them. Mm-hmm. And that is not anything of what we find in, a, we, we have no, the slightest reference of exactly. any sort of sexual engagement in the virginal conception. This is the work of the Holy Spirit yes. and not a divine being who's uh, disguised himself as another human mm-hmm. like Zeus does. Uh, so we're, we're, we don't find analogies uh, with this, with any other religious perspective, uh, no other no. stories in the ancient world come anywhere close to those, anything. Those stories uh, almost seem like just myths, fables. They're so far out there that... Right. Well, you know, but stories. like with Hercules, there is this uh, uh, concern to give some account for someone who has great power. You know, there, there's probably some figure way, way back in, mm-hmm. you know... Uh, 8th century, 13th century B.C., 13th century B.C., where he was known for his prowess, his virility, and so on mm-hmm. and so forth, and he gets exalted to the status of a hero, and then that's explained by some sort of divine intervention and so right. forth. Uh, but, but <laughs> you know, uh, Jesus isn't like that. No, um, not at all. Jesus isn't a Hercules, who, you know, can beat up on the Trojans and so on and so forth. Um, Oddly enough, this uh, word made flesh is in in whom God's glory is revealed. That glory is most revealed at the cross Mm -hmm. where he's not causing others to suffer. He's taking that on himself. And I I think it's, correct if I'm wrong, I think it's in Colossians, it says, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In bodily form, in yeah, Colossians 2.9. Yeah, yeah, exactly so. Yeah, so that just uh, shows more about Scripture and taking it all throughout the New Testament. Yeah. Not a Hercules, not any of these other kinds of stories. We What we have, uh, certainly in the Gospel of Luke, is an emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's something that we need to give attention to. If, if, mm-hmm. if pastors are going to want to uh, reaffirm this biblical sure. emphasis, one of the things we might want to do is explore, well, what is the significance of the work of the Holy Spirit in this, this setting? And, and what would uh, the early church that knew its Old Testament what would they have heard in this emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it, some things are are pretty clear. The Holy Spirit would come upon prophets to yes. enable them to speak. Mm-hmm. And so Ezekiel, you know, uh, the the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes upon Ezekiel and gives him utterance and so mm-hmm. forth. The school of the prophets. The school of Samuel. prophets. Yeah, the Spirit it, yeah of God exactly. Would come upon them. Uh, uh, well, you point to Samuel. But also in Samuel, we've got Saul, Saul, on whom the Spirit comes. He prophesied. And he prophesies. Mm-hmm. But here's a king mm-hmm. who is anointed. So you've got prophets, you've got a king. Yeah. And then the tragic story of Saul unfolds. And in First mm-hmm. Samuel 16, it's 
uh, we have this sad uh, account where the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul and now rests mm -hmm. upon David. David. And so we have this really important emphasis on, uh, of the work of the Holy Spirit um, in the house of David. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that makes a clear connection with Jesus as yes, Israel's true and ultimate king. Yes. Um, and conceived of the Holy Spirit, and one of the first things out of Jesus' mouth is gonna be, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me mm -hmm. to proclaim good news. Yeah. But to me, one of the most important connections between what we have in like Luke 2 and the Old Testament is the language of the, the, uh, the Spirit will overshadow you. Okay. And to me, that's very reminiscent mm -hmm. of Genesis chapter one, where yeah, the Spirit of God spirit hovered, hovered over the face of the deep. Yeah, I like that. Um, and in so many ways, what we find with the this central affirmation of the virginal conception of Jesus, what difference does it make? What are we talking about? We're talking about new creation. Yeah. We're talking about as the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, or mm -hmm. Psalm 104, which says the Spirit is that which sustains every living thing in God's mm -hmm. creation. But what we have with the Spirit bringing new life into the world through Christ is, well, we have, um, yes, continuity with the Old Testament story. And, Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Jesus is Israel's true king. Jesus is the ultimate prophetic voice. Jesus is the bearer of the new creation. And I think that is, uh, that is the, the turning point from the old to new. And it is the reminder to us that, uh, well, of what John says, that in... Uh, <laughs> Uh, in Moses, we got the law, and that's vital. Yes, sure. But in the Word, grace, we have grace and truth. truth. Yeah. And something new has happened here. Yeah. And I think the, the language of the Holy Spirit involved in the uh, conception of Jesus is this reminder that we have here the shift from the old to the new creation. I'm sure when... Joseph heard this from Mary. His reaction uh, was quite astonishing, probably hurt. Uh, yeah. You could imagine how he felt. That, now, you know, that's such know, an important point right there. You know, <laughs> hang, hang yeah. on a minute, Mary. Well, and here's, here's the, the deal, you know, maybe the, the culture despisers of religion yes. uh, these days would say, well, people back then and there, they... They might believe that sort of thing. Well, listen, Joseph knew where babies came from. Yes, he did. Uh, they all, they all that's, a, know. that's a point where C.S. Yeah. Lewis made, you know, in yeah. his mere Christianity. Joseph knew where, you know, but at the same time, they also didn't live within a closed universe. Right. That's part of our trouble these days is. as we live within what one sociologist calls the imminent frame. We think all there is is what we can Mm -hmm. uh, detect through our senses and what we therefore can control and manipulate. Right. We, it doesn't we, account for the work of the Holy Spirit. It, 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 and that there is reality that goes way, way beyond what we have under our control. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a very limited view. It, it, drastically so. Yeah. And, and one, I think, that ultimately leads to uh, a despair. But what is Joseph yeah. here that... Mm -hmm changes his tune. He is yes. told, don't be afraid. This is the work of God. Yeah, he has an encounter with, yeah. with God or yeah. with the angel, and uh, that is uh, the turning point for him. But it raises, yeah. you know, uh, your, your question about Joseph yeah. and what would, you know, Mary comes and says yeah, this. I got some news for you. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is, it raises this question of how do we respond? What is the appropriate response? Yeah. Good. to this announcement. As time goes by, the early church is going to shift more and more of a focus on to Mary, and even to the point where she is uh, 
discussed as a right. co-redemptrix. Yes. Uh, and mm-hmm. I just don't, there, there's no real basis for that in the no. New Testament. It no. becomes really prog- problematic down the road. I mean, that's one of the well, things. You- you see her and her response, she is actually worshiping God and calling God my Savior. Yeah. She evidently, as a young woman, had a very good handle from my reading of the Old Testament and the scriptures, uh, just in her uh, expression of gratitude that she would be blessed the way she yeah. was, you know. We well, you say from the scriptures, you know, you look at, what does she do? Uh, she she says, and, and to me, we, we need to look to Mary. Mary is an yes. appropriate mm-hmm. model of discipleship. Yes. Not co-redemptrix, but a model of discipleship. And what does she say? Be it done unto me as Glory the Lord has said. Mm-hmm. That, and, 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 and what done? She is to be, now here's a term that did develop, and I like it, and I think it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, she would ultimately be called Theotokos, mm-hmm. the bearer of God. I like that too. The Theotokos. Now, she has a unique role in that sense, but I, I do think that in a derived sense, an appropriate response to this whole message of, of the coming of Jesus is that we are called to be Theotokoi. That's the plural of Theotokos. We are to be God bearers. God bears, yeah. And that Christ dwells within us, and we are to echo Mary, be it done unto me as the Lord has said. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this this song, and I'm sure you've heard it, Mary, Did You Know? Oh, okay? yes, sure. And the song kind of, I, I think, pulls back a little bit because it doesn't say, Mary, did you know that one day he'd be arrested and then he would be tried and he would be yes. falsely accused and then convicted yeah. and then beaten and then been, then crucified. Did you know all of that? Mm-hmm. And no, of course, uh, she didn't know. It, you know, any and every parent uh, goes into parenthood with all sorts of surprises that will lie ahead, mm-hmm. but she is the bearer of the world's source of redemption, mm-hmm. and it will be a costly uh, journey. Mm. Uh, if we're to be thought uh, I, I think we, we need to... It's a price just, to pay. And, and, and here, with reference to this in crucial insistence, uh, somebody would like to explain the virginal conception, somebody would like to render it palpable um, and palatable, I should say, on terms that anybody and everybody would be able to make sense of. This is, this is part of the scandal of a crucified Messiah. Mm-hmm. This is part of the scandal of the gospel message uh, that through this unique means that God is at work to reconcile the world to himself, but because it is unique, because it is without analogy, because it won't fit into conventional accounts of mm-hmm. how we think everything is supposed to operate, uh-huh. uh, to be theotokoi is to maybe to shoulder with Mary a measure of the risk of being misunderstood. Yeah. How did Joseph <laughs> uh, respond at first? Uh, uh, thankfully, Joseph was attentive to God's direction in, mm-hmm. in his life. Yeah. But uh, certainly this message is subject to distortion. The long history of the struggle of the church to grapple with this reminds us that this is complicated and uh, uh, will bring the elements of confusion and the prospects for misinformation, all of that is is possible, certainly, but we need to get back certainly to a fundamental affirmation that uh, the Word was made flesh and we behold, we behold God's glory uh, through this one who was born to Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. 